Luke 11, starting at verse 9, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. Everybody say everyone. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be. Everyone say, it shall be. Say it like you believe it. It shall be. It shall be opened. Ask, it'll be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it shall be opened. Uh, today, I want to work through this passage, communicate a simple thought to us that I will title The Promise of the Father. The Promise of the Father. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today through his word, shall we? Father, we love you. We thank you for your presence that's here today. We thank you that because your presence is here, we know your word is about to go forth and there can be a creative work done in the life of each of the hearers. Lord, we ask that our heart would be fertile soil to receive the seed of the word. And I ask today that as your word goes forth, that it would illuminate the heart and mind of the each hearer today. We ask, Lord, help us to be doers also of the word and not hearers only. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This chapter starts off with uh, what my Bible here calls the model prayer. The model prayer. Uh, we also have probably heard of it as the Lord's Prayer. Um, however, I think a better way to communicate this is the model prayer or the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples because that's what it is. The disciples come to Jesus uh, after he was praying in a certain place and uh, when he had ceased, his disciples said, Lord, Teach us to pray. And so Jesus begins and says, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Now, notice this. Just real quick. We start praying, Lord, God, oh God, God, we come before you. You know, nothing's technically wrong with that except for uh, we can, uh, as people, uh, begin to view him less like our father and more like just some deity that we have to appease. And so what Jesus is communicating in the beginning of this prayer is relationship. He is your heavenly father. And if he's your heavenly father, you need to address him as so. Our father. Call him father because that's what he is. No child here today. Well, I don't know if you do or not. I've heard some kids do that being funny or disrespectful, I guess. It just kind of depends on the tone. You can tell a lot with tone, you know. Um, can I get an amen? You can tell a lot with tone. But uh, typically, traditionally, for you know, since the beginning, most kids don't call their parents by their proper name. They call them by a title that they are. The father, we understand, is not a name. It's a title. Because there's a bunch of fathers in here that all have different names. Right? Um, and so, with that in mind, we don't call our dad, you know, I mean, I don't know, Sister Bridget, you, hey, Terry, you know, you, maybe once or twice, but may, never, 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 never done that. So it's dad or papa or papa. There we go. So that is the title of endearment that, sig I, you know, I, he calls himself papa. You know, I may call you papa. I may work on it, you know, and see here. Can I call you papa? Is that okay? 
Okay, so, you know, we're, I'm there. That's because I'm not a stranger on the street anymore. A couple years ago I may have been, but uh, not anymore. So I, we're getting somewhere. Why? The relationship has changed. So what we have to understand is it would be a shame <clears throat> to be faithful to this God that we read about who manifested himself in flesh as Jesus Christ and we never get the revelation of he's our father. But we see the principle throughout scripture about being born again of the water and spirit. Born again, you're born. Well, every person that's born has a father. So if you're born again of water and spirit, of talking about a spiritual birth, who's your father? Because the principle of birth means there had to be a father. And so, you know, we see this principle. That's how we ought to pray. We need to call him father a lot more than we call him anything else, if that's what he really is in your life. And if he has saved you and adopted you into his family, which is Romans 8 talks about when, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, our spirit bears witness with his spirit that we are the children of God. And later on he talks about whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The moment a person is filled with the Holy Ghost and that initial experience of infilling, that is the sign that God gives that person and every person around that may be a witness of it, that's my child. That's the adoption papers, if you will. And now, because that person has become a child of God, he is their father, and that indwelling spirit of God that is in them now goes to work to produce fruit. Had a great topic, a discussion about this yesterday that we need to get into as a church soon, talking about the fruit of the spirit. But um, all of that in mind, there's got to be a moment where you're born again. And the creator God becomes your heavenly father through this spiritual adoption process. And so he's talking about how you start this prayer, you call him father. He goes through the different uh, categories to pray, the different topics to cover, the different subjects that you want to address in your prayer. One is submission to his kingdom and his will. The next is admission of reliance on him, both physically and spiritually. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not just talking about food. It's not just talking about money. It's also talking about spiritual reliance. Jesus is the bread of life. His word is sustenance to our spirit man. So by that admission, I rely on you spiritually. I also rely on you in this natural realm. I, I, every blessing, every good thing in my life is because of you, Jesus. Yes, I work hard, but everything I do, I do with all my might, and I do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul talks about that. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have that, and then this, uh, this confession Forgive us of our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. So it's like this. Don't ask God to forgive you until you've already forgiven somebody else. That's how it reads. Forgive us of our sins because we've already forgiven these people. Jesus talks about in Matthew in the commentary of this same setting. If you don't forgive... Your heavenly Father will not forgive you either because forgiveness is part of imaging God. Did you know that? We want him to forgive us, but we don't want to forgive others. Well, he's not going to forgive you because you're not imaging him. He is a Father that forgives. He is a God of forgiveness. And so we do that and we pray that. Then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil prayer to continue to live a way that's pleasing to him to pass the test and then Jesus gets to this this is where I really want to begin to focus on a couple things to help us today because we all know God's our father we've been born again of the water and spirit he's our father he's adopted us into his family we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light we all believe that today 
If you obeyed the new birth, if you have, you are his child. But then, it doesn't stop there. It would be really weird. If little baby Rhett was that same size for 30 years, right? Something would be wrong. Why would that principle be any different for us spiritually? Go to church. I'm the same person I was a decade ago. Something's wrong. There's got to be this development and this continual growth because God is a great God and you cannot fully explore the complete ends of him. You know, they talk about uh, where Jesus sits on the right hand of majesty. Well, you show me God's right hand. Where's the end of God's right hand? Now, that's in he a Hebrew term referring to to power and uh, you know where, where's the end of God on this side and where's the end of God on that side I mean you so you can't explore all that God is and have him completely figured out in the sense of well I dedicated myself really hard for three years to learn all there is about God I'm done I, I, I'm good oh because that's not relationship either that's called university Go for four years, get your degree, you're done. This isn't university, this is family. This is a relationship with our Heavenly Father. And uh, every person here today needs to continually develop and grow in this revelation of this fact. He is my Heavenly Father, first and foremost. And so Jesus is communicating uh, something beginning in verse 5 after he finishes teaching them this model prayer of subjects to cover, topics to address, and all of that. Uh, he says unto them, which of you shall have a friend? Anybody have a friend today? They asked that question at camp meeting and like 18% didn't raise their hand. I was like, wow, you all must be lonely. I mean, everybody's got to have at least one friend. And if you're not, if you don't, let me know. I'll be your friend. Because nobody should not have a friend. Um, of course, if you never talk to anybody, you may have something to do with that. <laughs> uh, just show yourself a little friendly. You'll be surprised. Uh, anyway, I'm just meddling now. So let's move on. Um, I didn't write that down, so that just came to me. So I'll show you my notes. Um, verse 5, Jesus says to them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight. Anybody have a friend that call him at midnight or knock on their door at midnight? Okay. Because I wouldn't answer the door. And everyone's like, well, we know not to call him at midnight. Nah. <laughs> nah. My phone goes on like a do not disturb type thing. And so if you need to get a hold of me, like either call my wife or, uh, or call like three times and I think it goes through. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, uh, you know, so far it's working out well. Um, at midnight, this friend, Jesus is, you know, coming up with a good example here. A friend comes, he's like, you know, goes to your house at midnight and, and, and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I don't have anything to give him. And he, from within, the guy inside the house at midnight, rubbing sleep out of his eyes, will say, trouble me not. Yeah, that's good KJV language. Leave me alone. The door's shut. He didn't even open the door for his friend. <laughs> He's talking to him on the other side of the door. Because <laughs> you know if you open the door, it's going to be another hour before you get rid of him, right? He's like, man, if we make eye contact, this is going to be a long conversation. You know, <laughs> anyway. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And uh, <laughs> you got to choose your friends wisely. And um, so uh, he's talking to him on the other side of the door. Leave me alone. The door is shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you what you need. In verse 8, Jesus makes a statement. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend. He's not going to give it to him because he's his friend. Yet because of, of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So the guy, 
pestering his friend at midnight, knocking on the door, and they're having a conversation, you know, on the other side of this door, is going to get what he wants, but not because the person is his friend. It's because of his importunity. Anyone use that word lately? Not me either. I had to look it up. Importunity, to press or urge with troublesome persistence. The guy got what he wanted, not because the person he went to was his friend, but he annoyed that person, kept pestering him, kept with this urgent request, kept asking until he got what he was asking for. And Jesus is communicating to his disciples this example. The guy got what he wanted because he just kept asking. Are we missing out as children of God on promises that may not come easy, but they're still promises simply because we stopped asking? Are we living below uh, our potential as a child of the creator of heaven and earth simply because we stopped seeking? Are doors in our life no longer opened or no longer going to open simply because we stopped knocking? Because the example Jesus gives us is the guy that knocked on the door of his friend's house at midnight and asked for bread got what he was asking for. Not simply because he asked his friend, but he kept asking his friend until he got what he was asking for. Not simply because he wanted it for no reason, but he had a need. I need bread to give to somebody else. I wasn't prepared for this, but I need this. I need you to give it. Go to bed. Leave me alone. It's midnight. No, I need this. I can't go back to where I came from until I have what I'm asking for. So you may not want to open the door, but I'm not leaving this door until it opens. You're beginning to see today. What type of faith Jesus is beginning to teach his disciples. Faith is not simply, oh, I believe God can do anything, so if he wants to, he will. No, faith is, I believe God can do anything, so I'm going to keep asking, I'm going to keep seeking, and I'm going to keep knocking until I see the impossible. (laughs) Anybody believe that today? These words are written in red so you can stand upon them because they're forever settled. They're never going to pass away. And if Jesus is teaching his followers 2,000 years ago this principle, just keep asking, just keep seeking, just keep knocking because you're going to get what you're asking for, then I think today, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we need to take this to the bank. He made me a promise. I'm going to keep asking. He promised me something. I'm going to keep seeking. God has got this promise on the other side of this doorway. I'm going to keep knocking on the door until I break through the door and that opens in my life. If you believe that today, why don't you shout amen? Amen. Amen. Importunity. In the Bible, in the, in the Gospels, it talks about this impotent man. He's just like, that's not who the church should be. Helpless, hopeless, laying around like a carcass. Because... If we're Holy Ghost filled, you have the very life source of all creation in you. And we can't be so sensitive. Well, I prayed for two weeks and nothing happened. I'm done. I guess God's mad at me. My feelings are hurt. I'm not going to go. My dad didn't give me what I wanted. Mm -mm. If 
you got a promise. Pestering. God made me a promise. And one day I'll share it with you. I pray him for it every day. Because he promised it to me. And he confirmed that it's on the way. And so I keep praying. I keep asking. I keep seeking. I keep knocking. Because I'm like, Lord, you promised this to me. So you need to bring it to pass. And I'm going to keep praying that until I see it. And then one day I'll share it with you. What I'm here today to say is we need to get some passion back in our spirit to get some importunity in our lives that no, this guy, this opportunity, this door hasn't been opened yet. I haven't got what I need yet, but I'm not going to stop asking until I get what I need because I know Jesus said in verse 10, for everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth and to him that knocketh it shall be opened he doesn't exclude anyone the only exclusion is if you're not asking you're not getting anything if you're not seeking you'll never find anything and if you're not knocking the door's not going to be opened but if you have to knock for six months I'm going to get bloody knuckles knocking on this door if I have to keep asking for a year I'm going to lose my voice asking God for this to happen whatever it is whatever's in your life whatever situation you're going through whatever promise God has made you do not stop asking do not stop seeking and do not stop knocking because Jesus said you're going to get what you're asking for that is the promise of the father anybody believe that today you just got to ask him one more time and then what if it doesn't happen then? Then ask him one more time. Well, what if it doesn't happen then? Ask him one more time. You just got to stay one prayer ahead until you see it. One more time. Knock, it didn't open. Well, one more time. Knock, it didn't open. Well, one more time. Knock, it didn't open. I'm looking. I was looking today. I was seeking God today. Nothing happened. Seek him again tomorrow. I was seeking God t tomorrow. Nothing happened. Seek him again tomorrow. The next day, the next day, the next day. Well, it seems absurd to the flesh. That's why we've got to keep doing it. Because the things of the Spirit just don't make sense to the flesh. It's, it's ridiculous. Well, I asked. Nothing happened. I'm done. Well, has anyone ever seen the... There's drawings of a cartoon, the guy, you know, tunneling, digging however far he was digging, <clears throat> quits. And then it pans in, another guy comes along, starts tunneling, and it shows when the guy walks away, he was that far from like breaking through to like this massive diamond. What if you were asking for 20 days but day 21 was the day that if you would have asked him on that day, you would have got it. That's why Jesus just simply says, he doesn't say how long. He doesn't put any limitations or stipulations on this. He just says, ask. One time, he leaves that up to you. Ask. It's the same idea that we see in the, um, in the Old Testament. I think it's first or second kings and uh, <clears throat> the prophet tells the king to strike the ground he just says strike the ground and so he takes an arrow strikes the ground three times the prophet gets mad at him and rebukes him and says because you've only done it three times you're going to lose but if you would have done it six, seven, eight times or whatever you would have got complete victory it's this idea that it's not about following a formula or adhering to a list of guidelines. It's all about faith. Do you want it from God or not? I do. Not with that attitude. <laughs> do you want to see the promise or not? I do. 
Not with that attitude. Ask. How long? Ask. You're not answering my question. No, I am. Ask. Two weeks, a month, two years? Ask. You're frustrating me, Jesus. What does that mean? Ask. But when do I have to, when do I quit asking? When have I gone too far? Ask. One more time. One more time. One more day. One more knock. Seek one more day importunity is there's this troublesome persistence in you that even when you want to stop, you can't. (laughs) I want to quit, but I can't quit. I want to walk away, but I can't walk away. I want to throw in the towel, but I can't throw in the towel. There's something in me that says I got to give it one more day. There's something in me that says I got to knock one more time. There's something in me that says I got to give it one more shot. I can't quit. I can't quit. Those are the people that Jesus says, if you'll just stay at it, you're going to see it. You're going to receive it. The door is going to open in your life. My question today, is there anybody at New Life Church that's got one more try in you, one more day in you, one more prayer in you, one more knock in your spirit? I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Why don't we just worship the Lord for a moment? Tell him, Jesus, I got one more shot. I got one more try. I got one more knock. I got one more prayer left in me. Oh, come on, lift your voice for a moment. Get a little importunity in your spirit. Get a little troublesome persistence in your prayer for a moment. Seek the Lord for that promise. Seek the Lord for that promise. It's a promise of the Father that if you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, it will be opened. It's a promise from the Father. Why don't you take that promise to the bank for a moment? What's the promise that you've been praying for? What's that need that you need God to meet? What's that situation you need God to intervene in? Well, you need to ask him. You need to seek him. You need to knock because you have a promise. Amen. However we see here today, I believe this last part will help us. Verse 11, Jesus transitions to make a point. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will the father give him a stone? That's a bad dad. What a loser. Dad, I'm hungry. Can I have some bread? Here, son, here's some coal. (laughs) Get lost. I mean, what a jerk. And so Jesus asked the question to this group of guys because then the guys are going to be like, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I know I did it last week, but I'm not about to admit that now. Jesus had a good way of pegging people with his questions. Or he, he takes it a step further, okay? That's where I get it from. Jesus, you can always count on me to take it a step further. (laughs) If the son asks for bread, will the father give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Now things have crossed the line. That's just too far. (laughs) I mean, all right, dad, the joke isn't funny anymore. You know, dad, can I, can I get some of that salmon? No, but you can have this rattlesnake. I mean, you know, like, okay, Dad. Um, Jesus is, uh, or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Jesus is trying to communicate something. Watch this. The previous chapter, Jesus sends his disciples out into cities, and, um, to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and all of that. And he makes a statement. The previous chapter, one chapter before what we've been working through, 
He says, behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, I've heard stories, missionaries. It's one powerful couple. Some of you may know them. Uh, the wife was in Thailand. And they were preparing for a dinner. and She reaches through the fence to move something or whatever. And a very poisonous, uh, I think rattlesnake, or no, king cobra. King cobra bit her. And uh, the husband said, I became very afraid and worried. Her hands swelled up. But she didn't do a thing. She just kept going about her business. No complications ever. Bit by a king cobra. You're supposed to die, you know, when stuff like that happens. And uh, not even any health issues. Just kept going about the day, finished the dinner, had the couple over, did their thing. So we understand in the natural that um, the Lord can protect and, and all of that. But there's a deeper spiritual principle here that the Lord is teaching when he says, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. He's not talking about literal serpents and scorpions, even though, like I shared an example with you, that could apply. He's talking about spirits, evil spirits, serpents and scorpions in a Hebrew narrative, even in the Old Testament. It's, it's referring to evil Spirits And Jesus says, I give you authority over those things. So, when Jesus says, he's using natural examples, but there's a spiritual uh, principle he's communicating because verse 13 will reveal this to us when we read it in a second. If a son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If he asks for an egg, will... He offer him a scorpion. In other words, when the son asks the father for a gift, will the father give the son an evil gift? No. What kind of father would he be? So then, Jesus, after setting it up with his question, he says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts... To your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. You're not going to get an evil spirit from God. You're not going to get an evil gift from God. And the Holy Ghost is for anyone and everyone, and all you got to do is ask Him. Father, baptize me with the Holy Ghost, just like on the day of Pentecost. Baptize me with this good gift from above. It's not an evil thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's actually good for me. And it's the will of God that anyone and everyone receive of his spirit. That's why he came. That's why he came to this earth to make it possible that he no longer had to dwell in tents, but you could be the tent. You could be the tabernacle. You could be the temple. And if you want him to move in, all you got to do is ask. Well, I prayed one time. No Nothing happened. Jesus said, ask again. Well, I did, and I just didn't seem to get a breakthrough. Jesus said, ask again, because if you really want it, you won't stop asking until you get what you're asking for. So my question today is, do you want it? Do you want a Holy Ghost breakthrough? Do you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost the first time today? How bad do you want it? Do you really want it? Do you want God to break through in this church? Do you want him to break through in your family? Do you want to see the promises he's made us come to pass? Do you want to see it? How bad do you want to see it? How badly you want to see it will be determined by how adamantly you ask. How badly you want to see these things come to pass will be determined by how troublesome, persistent you are in pursuing after God. I want it. I want it. I want it. 
baptize me with the Holy Ghost. I want to experience your presence the way I see this person when they're worshiping. I want that in my life. I want to experience the joy and the liberty and the freedom I see others have when they're worshiping God. I want that in my life. Well, you got to ask him. And you're never going to get it until you ask. You'll never get it until you ask. So this is my question today. Is there any faith in the heart of anybody today?